Here at the Gospel of John, you see the text there, chapter 7, moving to verse 40 this morning. So if you want to take out your Bibles and turn with me, that would be great. Gospel of John, chapter 7, verse 40. The um, bulletin, the worship guide says that my title is um, one thing, and I was thinking about Nicodemus quite a bit in preparation and how the cross affected him, but further reflection, I've changed the title to the sermon this morning, and if you want to make a note of it, pick a side and stick to it. Jesus causes division. He is a polarizing figure. And the challenge of today really rests, the challenge in my assignment to preach this text really rests in the work of the Spirit. It's His work to break through the crust of our hearts. Yes, I just called you crusty, but I love you. I'm not saying anything this morning that most of you have not heard. And that's the challenge. Most of you have grown up in church. You've gone to church a long time. And a sermon that exalts Jesus for who He is and calls us to treasure Him and give our allegiance to Him is something you've heard much of. But we need this exhortation. You need it. And so I hope that our attentiveness this morning will be by the Spirit. um, And that we will indeed be encouraged by what we hear this morning. My second challenge is to move uh, successfully from the observation, and this is really a challenge for all of us, you'll you'll hear this, this, this sermon this morning, but to move from the observations of the text to the actual living. It won't be my intention to be in your face today. If I do, it's, it's something God's doing. If you feel like your mail's being read, it's not because I've been in your mailbox. I have not. But as I began to prepare this sermon and the theme for our year, if you notice on the front of the bulletin, Learning to Live Soli Deo Gloria, 2019, this application of the gospel will sustain us through this year. It's what we're going to be about, applying the gospel, living for His glory and His glory alone. We have a challenge today. I, I just, so many opportunities in my week last week to be faithful, and I failed miserably every turn. Relationally, just, you know, there I am ta- thinking and talking about, you know, to myself about learning to live, soli deo gloria, and here would be an opportunity right in front of me, and I would miss it. And so this is going to be harder to do than it is to preach. But i got to preach it in order for us to do it. So let's enter into the text, the polarizing nature of Jesus. Pick a side and stick to it. Verse 40, Some of the people, therefore, when they heard these words, were saying, This certainly is the prophet. Others were saying, This is the Christ. Still others were saying, Surely the Christ is not going to come from Galilee, is he? Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the descendants of David and from Bethlehem, the village where David was? So a division occurred in the crowd because of him. Some of them wanted to seize him, but no one laid hands on him. The officers then came to the chief priests and Pharisees, and they said to them, Why did you not bring him? The officers answered, Never has a man spoken the way this man speaks. The Pharisees then answered them, You have not also been been led astray, have you? No one of the rulers of the Pharisees has believed in him, has he? Notice what happens as we move forward. But this crowd, which does not know the law is accursed. Nicodemus, he who came to him before, being one of them, 
They were wrong about their little insight about none of them believing, right? He says to them, he says to the rulers of the Pharisees, Our law does not judge a man unless it first hears from him and knows what he's doing. Does it? They answered him. You are not also from Galilee, are you? Search and see that no prophet arises out of Galilee. Everyone went to his home. God, we do pray for your help this morning, that you would illuminate this scripture by your spirit. Uh, but not just light. We don't just simply pray for light. We pray for, for heat as well, to have passion, to live for Jesus. And that he would be more desirable to us than the pleasures of this world. And that we would put our lot with him and with no other. Amen. So this morning as I preach through this text, I'll do so under three headings. They're not really three points as much as they are three movements. We're going to observe the narrative. And then we'll look at the meaning of this story. And then the application. The narrative itself, the story we just read, I'm going to dig back into it and pull out a few things for us to observe and then summarize. In fact, I may even begin with the summary, but I'll come back to it and a few things to say about it and then the application. So if you're a note taker, there's you an outline and you can begin to plug things in as we get to them. Jesus is indeed a polarizing figure. This morning, as I said earlier, our challenge will be then Realizing that we must believe in Him and the truths of Scripture about Him and then declare our allegiance to Him as God in the flesh, our Savior, God's, God's Messiah, God's Christ, and only Redeemer. Because He divides men, and He does, there is a right and there is a wrong. There's a right side and a wrong side. And to be, to be with Jesus is to be on the right side. Not to be with Jesus is to be on the wrong side. To be on the right side is to live in Christ, soli deo gloria. I brought home a t-shirt a few years ago to, uh, to Noah. He got, he's outgrown it and his sisters are inheriting it. But it's a great t-shirt on the front of it is in Greek letters. So... People don't know what it says, generally. Um, doxa to theu. I love teaching my children how to read it so that when they get asked out in public, what does your shirt say? Uh, they'll actually know what it says. Um, and of course, then what comes is, well, what does doxa to theu mean? The glory of God. It is that fifth of the five solas, the soli, Deo Gloria, which is Latin, to God alone be the glory. It is the purpose that we are, for which we are called to live. And because Jesus is a polarizing figure, this division that we're about to observe in this story is very important because that division still exists among us. It may even divide some of us in this very room. And it's important to observe it, isolate it, draw a circle around it, understand it. And then change the way we live as a result of what we see. So first, let's look at the crowds. This group that, that the ruling Pharisees called accursed, there's a division among them. Uh, a threefold division, if you will. Uh, some people think he's the prophet. It's from Deuteronomy 18, 15. Moses gave that prophecy that God would raise up one like him from among his brothers. So Moses was able to... By, by prophetic inspiration of the Spirit, he was able to look down through the corridors of time and prophesy that God would raise up another Moses. Jesus is that prophet. They have question about whether or not he's that prophet, but he is. It's what he was doing on the, on the day he preached the Sermon on the Mount. All that stuff about, you have heard it said of old, and he quotes the law, but I say to you, and he gives a, a deeper interpretation. He does nothing to contradict the law of God, but he does do something to further drill down about how to live it out. He was showing himself to be the new Moses, the next, the second Moses coming to deliver his people. But they just, some, some disagreed with him and they were saying, well, he's the Christ. 
And they had different ideas about what that meant. Generally, it was a political concept at this point, generally among the Jews, that that meant as a son of David, he was going to raise an army and kick Rome out and bring independence, political independence to the nation of Israel. And then others were like, I don't think he's the Christ. He's not even born in the right place. He comes from Galilee. Remember how we tried to clear up that confusion? That, that even among us, there can be confusion about we think so-and-so is from, you know, wonderful places like Alabama, only to find out they're from Georgia. You know, it's, I know it's very disappointing, but, uh, you know, nevertheless, you find these things out. They, too, were deceived. They really didn't know where Jesus was from because he is from Bethlehem, as the scriptures said Messiah would be. But more importantly, by Jesus' own teaching, he wasn't really from any of those places at all. He was from heaven. He was from God the Father. Which even though it was a superstition, it proved the superstition to be true. They really did not know where Messiah would come from. So there's this threefold division. Um, but then there's also further division. This division, this first division is among the crowd. But then, but then the Pharisees themselves end up being divided and shown to be deceived and truly biased. Keep moving forward in the text. The Pharisees have hired some, some soldiers, some policemen, uh, if you will, uh, to go and arrest Jesus, and, and they can't do it. They too, they find Jesus to be a polarizing figure, and they can't carry out their orders Nobody has ever talked the way this man talks. They wonder if the officers have been deceived. And they say, none, none of us are deceived. None, none of us have fallen prey, right? You certainly must have been taken under his spell. You know, charismatic leaders can do that to people, right? Right? I had, a, I had a dear friend that loves me very much tell me one time that I was kind of like that, kind of charismatic. If I wasn't careful, I would lead people astray. I really didn't know how to take that at the time. I've still been pondering it in my heart. Because my, my desire as a pastor, I would never want people to follow me. My whole life is to be about my finger pointing in a completely different direction. Just like John the Baptist, I must decrease, he must increase. It's always about Jesus, not about me. But charismatic figures can do that. They can, they can, they can make us think, wow, maybe, maybe he knows more than others know. And we could, we could learn and be powerful with him. And so they accused him of being deceived. But who was really deceived? They didn't even like Nicodemus's. Um, you get down to verse 50 and he shows up on the scene. And they say he's got a bias. Before that, in their rebuke of the, of the, of the officers, they make an accusation against the crowds. Um, they're accursed. That means they're, really, at the end of the day, that means they're ignorant. That they're, they're blind. They, they really can't, you know, they're like, they're like sheep. They just follow folks around. And it has to do with a curse that's on them. But then about Nicodemus, they say he's got a bias. Uh, he must be from Galilee also. And then they seek to lecture him. You know, Nicodemus knew. Nicodemus was well educated. He was smart. But they said he had a bias. The ones that seemed to really be cursed, the ones that seemed to really be deceived, and the ones that really have a bias are the leaders of the Pharisees. They are opposed to Jesus. And they lead in such a way as to make everyone around them be accused of something ungodly and unbiblical and unfaithful. I would pray, I would hope that religious leaders, the, the, the faithful, the pastors, the servants of God's church would not be like these religious leaders of the past. But that men of God are called to preach God's word. And as God's people, we are called to sit under God's word. Jesus is indeed a polarizing figure. We must therefore know what we believe about him and declare our allegiance to him. 
It's important in the content of our faith. We don't believe in some other Jesus than the Jesus presented to us in God's Word. And that is the Jesus that we love because the Word of God presents Him as more wonderful, more beautiful, more desirable than anything else in this world. This is the story here. This is the issue. He is a polarizing figure and there are divisions that arise because of him. That is so different than how typical modern, contemporary American people think about Jesus. And, and ministers. Um, Y'all remember a TV show that was on several years ago on the WB called, uh, I don't even know if that thing exists anymore, but it's called Seventh Heaven. Remember that TV show? I remember when it first came out, people were so excited. Here was supposedly a wholesome family show about a pastor. And he wasn't a pastor. He was a, he was a social community organizer. Um, now, none of the ministries like Meals on Wheels and stuff like that um, are bad in and of themselves. But the, the show, every time it showed him doing his work, it was always about him being in the community, doing good. And that's the way the, the world thinks about the work of a minister, because it's really at the end of the day how they think about Jesus. He brings, he brings social well-being. I was at a meeting here recently, networking in town, and a guy was telling me that he was excited that I was there because he really felt like we needed churches to band together to really help our community to be better. You know, apart from the gospel, there's really no helping our community be better. Not in the sense that he means. He was asking me to be a part of a social program, you know, job education. And I'm for, I'm for job education. I'm for helping folks who need help. But that's not my, that's not my work day in and day out. But the world thinks of the ministers of the church in this vein because at the end of the day, it's how they think of Jesus. And Jesus, Jesus didn't come to do any of those kinds of things. First and foremost, he came as a sacrifice for sins. He came as a polarizing figure, dividing history, dividing communities. It's not the only story in, in, the, in the Bible about Jesus, but it's, the, it's a prominent story about Jesus. He says, unless you, you hate your father and mother, anyone who loves their father, their family more than they love me is not worthy of me. Do not think I came to bring peace on the earth, but, but a sword. He's a polarizing figure who brings division. Because when we understand truly who He is, God in the flesh, the Savior of sinful human beings, God's Messiah, His Christ, our only Redeemer. And there's only one way to look at Him. So, as we look at this narrative, it's a narrative about division. It centers on who Jesus is. We look now at the meaning of that. There's no, no escaping it. C.S. Lewis has been famous for this quote. In Mere Christianity, he writes, I am trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people, people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on a level with the man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the Son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon. Or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. Those are strong words. It's polarizing, isn't it? Creates division. 
some of the question we have to answer is whether or not we're comfortable with that. I mean, because when we go against the world's program in favor of God's program, all the words of derision for Jesus, they get aimed and directed at us. I mean, just think about how the world feels right now about certain moral issues and the stance that the church takes against those. And if you do, and if you let it get on the internet that you do, you're in trouble. Um, lead singer of, of U2, um, a band probably many of you are familiar with, although some of you may not. Bono um, is something of a polarizing figure, and we don't always know where he stands about his Christian faith. But in an interview in 2004 with Mitchka Asias, a, a, a journalist, he says a very interesting thing that sounds very C.S. Lewis-esque. Maybe he had been reading Lewis on mere Christianity. Bono said in the interview, It's not our own good works that get us through the gates of heaven. The journalist replied, Such great hope is wonderful, even though it's close to lunacy. In my view, Christ has his rank among the world's great thinkers. thinkers but Son of God? Isn't that far-fetched? Bono's answer is really quite remarkable. And he makes Lewis's point, makes my point again, only perhaps more forcefully in view of who Bono is and the context where he said it. Isn't all that Son of God talk far-fetched? Here's the quote. No, it's not far-fetched to me. Look, the secular response to the Christ story always goes like this. He was a great prophet, obviously a very interesting guy, had a lot to say along the lines of other great prophets, be they Elijah, Muhammad, Buddha, or Confucius. But actually, Christ doesn't allow you that. He doesn't let you off that hook. Christ says, and he's paraphrasing obviously, but this is Bono. He says, Christ says, no, I'm not saying I'm a teacher. Don't call me, I wish I could do a, an English accent for you, and, but if I try, it's going to end up sounding goofy. But I mean, I can just see him and hear him. Um, he's a little melodramatic, he's a little more soft spoken than I am. So, you know, kind of with that cool demeanor. No, I'm not saying I'm a teacher. Don't call me a teacher. I'm not saying I'm a prophet. I'm saying I'm the Messiah. I'm saying I am God incarnate. And people say, no, 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 please, just be a prophet. A prophet we can take. You're a bit eccentric. We've had John the Baptist eating locusts and wild honey. We can handle that. But don't mention the M word, Messiah, he's talking about. Because you know we're going to have to crucify you. And then he goes on. No, no, no. I know you're expecting me to come back with an army and set you free from these creeps. But actually, I am the Messiah. At this point, everyone starts staring at their shoes and saying, and this isn't my language, this is his language. Um, oh my God, he's going to keep saying this. So what you're left with is either Christ was who he said he was, the Messiah, or a complete nutcase. I mean, we're talking nutcase on the level of Charles Manson. And I'm not joking here. The idea that the entire course of civilization for over half the globe could have its fate changed and turned upside down by a nutcase, for me, that's far-fetched, end quote. He's a polarizing figure. He divides. He divides families. He divides friends. He divides communities. It's a polarizing moment. Do I really believe Jesus is who he said he was and the scriptures claim for him to be? I mean, all those places in the God, and we're studying the Gospel of John now, right? All those places where he talks about being, I am. I am the bread of life. I, I am the, the living water. 
In John 8, next, in the next chapter, as we get to the end of it, he, he, even, he even has a claim to an eternal existence. He says, before Abraham was, I am. Boy, they get really angry with him when he says that. This claim to deity they, that is not missing them because he uses the language to indicate that he's talking about being the covenant Lord. He's, he's using the name Yahweh in that case, the ego a me of, of Exodus 3, 14 through 17. The burning bush event where Moses is introduced to the covenant name of God. In each of those cases, uh, Jesus is invoking that name. Saying, He's with, and in one place in John's gospel, in chapter 10, he'll even say, I and the Father are one. That there's a unity between God the Father and God the Son. He makes a claim that in the world's mind and heart and in the, in the minds and hearts of the Pharisees was audacious. Or like they might say down home, it's bodacious. It's crazy. I mean, listen, and, and, and I can't let you off the hook this morning. If I, if I asked you, if I just said, raise your hand, tell me how many of you really, you really love Jesus, you'd all raise your hand, wouldn't you? I mean, you're in church. Even if you had some doubt, you, you would not raise your hand because you're afraid somebody in your family would be looking. You, you wouldn't do that. You say, yes, yes, I love Jesus. I, be, I believe in him. And sometimes we think, man, if I had just lived back in that day and seen him and seen the things he did. But I'm going to tell you what, that would be the most, that's the most dangerous desire you can possibly have. Because I would tell you, for many of us in this room, if we had lived back then with the skepticism most of you live with, you'd be like, he says he's what? What did that preacher say again? Huh? Please been a dangerous time for most of you to live in. We live in a far better day by the illumination of the Holy Spirit, the completion of God's Word that gives us the full story and the full depth that we need to comprehend those claims that He makes. God has been very gracious to let us live at the point in the history in which we live because in our worst moments we have doubts. If we lived back then, those worst moments probably would have consumed many of us. And I know I'm speaking of in the flesh, sort of humanly speaking. He's a polarizing figure. We must therefore know what we believe about him so that we're not believing in a false Jesus, a Jesus of our imagination. And declare our allegiance to the Jesus of Scripture, God in the flesh, our Savior, Messiah, Christ. It's the same office. It's the Hebrew word and the Greek word, the anointed God's Savior, our only Redeemer. And declare our allegiance to Him. In a sense, we all need to put our t-shirt on. You put Solideo Gloria on the front and Doxa Tutheu on the back. I don't care whether you have, really have a t-shirt or not. I mean, if you want to get some, that'd be great. But I love the idea. But I'm speaking metaphorically, spiritually. Your baptism really was that t-shirt. That's when you put the team t-shirt on. And declared your allegiance. But it's the kind of allegiance that has to be renewed day in and day out. If 2019 can be a year that we really come to understand what it means to live soli deo gloria. Jesus Christ more desirable, more appealing, more pleasurable to us than the pleasures of this world. It can be a great year. It can be the kind of year that we see our church blossom in ways that has never blossomed. And I'm not talking about growth necessarily, although that might be one of the things that happens. But the kind of intimate fellowship and holiness of living that can be ours in Christ. When we stop living for ourselves and start living for Him in the real and practical ways that says we don't believe He was a nutcase. We believe he was God in the flesh. In Homer's Odyssey, he gives us a picture. He gives us a character named Achilles. Who is the one man who really gave us the philosophy about dying young and leaving a beautiful corpse. That was Achilles. 
Y'all aren't smiling enough about that. You can enter in, this is a story, you can enter into this with me. We'll come back to the really very serious stuff in just a second, but that's true. That was Achilles' one desire. He didn't want to live old. There's a whole, there's a whole section where he talks about not wanting to go back to Greece, um, even with all the fame and the accolades that would have been his, because he had had to become an old man. He had had to re-enter into the mundane things of life. Now, I don't want all the, all the women to say amen to this, you know, but um, maybe he's on to something because they're washing dishes and doing the laundry and all that. You know, that's, it's just hard work. I was praising my wife this morning as she, she sat in a chair and she folded some clothes that were, had come out of the dryer and she just diligently, faithfully was taking care of them. And uh, she got done. I, mean, I was such a dumb husband. You know, I didn't even offer to help. I'm just sitting there talking to her, enjoying her company. She just folding the clothes joyfully and servant-like and just doing it she got done and I looked and I saw what had happened and it dawned on me and I said you're amazing and that's Proverbs 31 right you gotta rise up and declare for everyone to know among women there's none like her she's a real treasure but we talk sometimes that cooking stuff it gets old you can say amen now that doing the laundry stuff, it gets old. Mopping the floors, that stuff, it gets... You know, I have no idea what just got said. Don't repeat it too loud, okay? But in this world, we've been given, we've been given this life to live. And whether it's in the mundane or whether it's in the really, really important stuff, it all has to be under the cross. It all has to be under the allegiance to Jesus, soli Deo Gloria, doxa to Theu. We can't be like Achilles, living for Kleos, that, that earthly fame, as opposed to the doxa of the New Testament, the glory that is God's. Our life has to take on that direction. Odysseus, Achilles' companion in war and in all kinds of other exploits, passed through all stages of life. He did grow to be an old man, and yet his aim was still to grasp the fame. He did return. That's what the whole story, that's what the Odyssey is about, is the return. And he returns to the mundane tasks of running a farm and a family. But in contrast to Achilles, Achilles just could not abide such a life. As followers of Christ, our head, our hands, and our heart have to be devoted. In the sermon this morning, my aim is at heart devotion. To preach in such a way that I stir your hearts up to a deeper affection for Jesus, that you would love His fame, that you would want to live for Him more than self. I care about our thinking. I care about the application of, our, of the work of our hands. But there'll be no right thinking, there'll be no work of our hands if our hearts are not stirred, if there's not a devotion for the Jesus of Scripture. Is He more desirable to you than all the offerings of this world? And their fleshly pleasure. You know, one place to answer that is when you're, when you're at your worst. Not right now. Take the question home. In a few days, a week from now, when you're lonely, when you're, when you're really feeling down and, you're, and, there's, and there's pity, self-pity, and you're wondering, why, what am I even doing? That's the time to ask yourself this question. That's the time to let the healing balm of the reality of the need for affection for Jesus to seep in, to sink in, into the heart, and change the devotion. You'll never resist the world's temptations to pleasure and power if Christ is not more appealing and desirable to you than these. And so I hope we see this morning in the narrative, in the meaning, and in the application that Jesus Christ is indeed a polarizing figure. So pick a side and stick with it. Heavenly Father, I pray this morning that as His people, that we indeed would see Jesus as more glorious and more desirable 
than ourselves and all of our other passions. In fact, Lord, I pray this morning that, that all of our other pursuits in life, that they would become subservient, submissive to this one biblical and glorious pursuit of your glory, of your name being known through our lives and into our community. As we stand to sing this last hymn about being God's people, I pray, God, it would be our prayer. And it would become, by your Spirit, reality among us. Because Jesus is at the center of who we are. It's in His name we pray. Amen.